My name is Daniel Del Solar. I was born in New York City in 1940, June 13th, the day that the Germans walked into Paris. And this is a germane because it was at the French hospital and everybody was very sad, very unhappy that the Nazis had taken over Paris. My mother, Luchita Hurtado Garcia, was born in La Guaira, Venezuela. And my father, Daniel del Solar, was born a Chilean citizen. Daniel was a journalist, worked for Time Magazine, knew Henry Luce and Claire Booth Luce quite well, was on the scene in New York City as one of the Latin American intellectuals, Miguel Covarrubias, uh, Flor Trujillo, and that mix, that very special mix of um, the survivors of Latin America and the Latin American intellectuals were in New York City. Uh, Pablo Armando Fernandez, who's a Cuban poet, also knew Daniel then. Fernando Alegria was a pal of Daniel's and they worked together at the OAS in Washington, D.C. And um, Fernando had stories of he and Daniel playing tricks on their United States boss and so on. From Mexico City, uh, from uh, New York City, we moved, my mother divorced Daniel, and we moved to Mexico City, where I lived in a German boarding school for three or four years, was it, in Churubusco. At that point, my mother was married to Wolfgang Pollen, a one of the Surrealists of, in, in Paris. He himself is Austrian and um, a collector of pre-Columbian objects and pre-Columbian art, I should say and uh, they lived in Mexico City. I lived in Mexico City. My brother, uh, Pablo, <coughs> who was two years younger than I, uh, also was, we were all together in Mexico City. Unfortunately, he contracted polio and he died uh, in 1948 at the age of six, and I was eight. Uh, a few years later, we moved to Mill Valley, Mill Valley in Marin County, Northern California, the Old Mill School, and thence uh, Lucida uh, divorced Pollen, and um, we lived in Los Angeles. And Lee Mulliken, a painter, one of the, he's sometimes called the Southwestern Surrealist, but by affiliation really, um, Pollen left Northern California in 1952, and rarely, if ever, returned to California. I got to know Pollen when I was 16 years old, when in high school I decided that he was a very interesting character. And so uh, um, I took a bus down to Mexico City. I rode with friends from high school to Mexico City. For three summers uh, during my high school years, I was in Mexico City and environs and traveled with Pollen all over the nation of Mexico, worked uh, uh, collecting pre-Columbian art, went on dangerous missions up in the mountains, uh, this kind of very, uh, looking back at it, I had thousands of dollars strapped on my body <laughs> in a money belt. Very interesting times. Then I went to Harvard, uh, graduate, was one of the few uh, Latinos we went, I think we had five of us, five Latinos in a class of 1,500, and a, perhaps a slightly larger number of uh, blacks, and I think one, maybe two Native Americans in the class. This was back class of 63, and this was 1959, and um, I studied uh, social relations, which was anthropology, psychology, and sociology in, um, at Harvard, graduated with honors, wrote my thesis in 1963, on machismo, the uh, origins of masculine identity in the Mexican middle class. I studied it. Graduating from Harvard, I got a Fulbright. I was lucky enough to get a Fulbright, went to Venezuela, 
My study project was to study the economic characteristics of the urban slum dwellers in Venezuela. I attended uh, classes at the University, La Universidad Central de Venezuela in Caracas, lived in the dorms before they were closed down because they were too political, the dorms were way too political, so the establishment had to eventually close these down, but I was there when it was full of very active political people. Studied about oil, studied sociology with Arturo Monzon, the Mexican sociologist and anthropologist. Traveled fairly widely in Venezuela, attending, um, going to, most, most memorably for me, attending the iron mine which Bethlehem Steel maintained in the middle of the Orinoco River, going there by private plane, by a private company airplane in the company of Mary Crew Yancey, and Yan Miss Yancey was the daughter of the head of operation, mining operations for Bethlehem in Venezuela. They had dredged the river, they had built a huge complex, they built a dam, electricity powered the uh, basically the eating up of a, of a giant iron ingot. In the United States and throughout the world, iron is um, mined at the, uh, at the rate of 3%. If you have an iron ore that's 3%, it's uh, commercially viable. Well, this mountain in Venezuela, which was called uh, Cerro Bolivar, was 80% iron, and it looks like this. This is what a piece of Venezuela looks like. It's 80% iron, it's heavy as lead. It's pure iron. This is the natural occurring, and there are a few places in the world where this happens, where such a thing occurs, where iron ore of this grade gathers. And this is my introduction, that, and I went to, the, of course, the oil fields in Lake Maracaibo, Again, company airplane, uh, this courtesy of the United States Embassy. And then I saved up my money and I wanted to go visit my father, Daniel Del Solar, with whom I had gotten in touch. Hadn't seen him since the age of five. And I took what I call, I like to think of as uh, the reverse motorcycle diaries because I started in Venezuela, went through Colombia, went down to Ecuador, Peru, went through the highlands of Peru, ended up in Bolivia, then down from Bolivia down to uh, um, Arica, which is in the northernmost portion of Chile, then a plane down to Santiago, where I saw my father for a week. Uh, I never did see him again alive. And this was thanks very much to the Fulbright and my, able, my ability to save some money to make this extraordinary trip. So I took a lot of photographs during that trip, and again, got in tune with what, what the conditions were, the living conditions of people there, the native people, the poor, the urban poor, and so on. And as a grace note, the last day I was in La Paz, Bolivia, the miners had a strike. So there, were, there I was ducking uh, tear gas in La Paz, Bolivia uh, in 1964. And this was part of my education and I saw the people protesting and so on and went to graduate school, ended up uh, finally in California in 1970 in the Bay Area where I, while washing my car, I tuned in the radio and I heard on KPFA Comunicación Aztlán and they were doing uh, programming about Latin America, the only place where there was like a focus, it was two hours of material that included poetry, culture, music, uh, news and stuff, what's happening in the community, uh, local issues, national issues, international issues. All of this brought to the airwaves on a radio station. Totally remarkable for me to discover this. And this is where I really learned, gee, media. And um, through a series of accidents, I ended up attending one of the meetings of Comunicación Aslan, and they were doing a radio drama at that point. And um, as the newbie, they said, oh, would you mind playing the role of the CIA officer? And I said, no, okay, I'll do that. Um, and so that 
so began my radio theater experience, taking the role. Eventually, I also worked with, uh, with um, Paper Tiger TV in New York City, uh, also doing drama and running audio and doing that kind of um, work, creative work in, in the media. Comunicación Aslan, 15 people, all volunteers. None of us had any media, previous media experience. We hadn't gone to school. We just did it. And the people at KPFA, Pacifica, were good enough, kind enough to give us hints and so on. And the equipment was uh, not perfect. And it was all a matter, a labor of love. And it cost money to do this because when I was living in San Francisco, I had to get to the Berkeley studios. So there was gasoline and bridge tolls and so on. And so there I was in Comunicación Aslan. And we worked together and we did brilliant programming for four years. I want to focus on one piece. We did a history on Colombia at that point because uh, one of our members was a Colombian, Nina Serrano, a poet. And so we started writing scripts and Isabel Alegría and I basically wrote five scripts of Colombian history. And we, it turns out as we looked at it, we said, well, let's do an hour on Colombia. Well, it turns out there's too much about Colombia to do it in one hour. So we did it from uh, when the natives ruled in Colombia to the arrival of the, uh, the Spaniards, from the Spaniards to the independence, from the, independ in the early 1800s, from uh, Spanish independence until the Bogotazo in 1948, and then from 1948 to such and such. So we did five one-hour historical programs with dramas written in, with music, appropriate music, and um, a a great series. Unfortunately, they did not find national distribution on NPR, but that's another story. While in the Bay Area, while living in San Francisco, one of the things that uh, we as a collective, because I joined the collective, one of the things that we did together was we thought, we want to know who our audience is. We want to be in touch with our audience. And in the sense that we were, we said, well, we should have a party. Where are we going to have a party? Well, at that point, I had a fairly good job, uh, assistant director of planning for the Anti-Poverty Agency in San Francisco, working with Jack Morrison, who had been a supervisor, board of supervisor member in San Francisco. And so Jack had hired me as the assistant director of planning for the Anti-Poverty Agency. And my apartment was a two-bedroom apartment. Didn't have a yard, but it was a two-bedroom apartment. So when it came time to have a party, I said, well, let's have the party at my house. And then, so in a rather modest-sized house, we had a band in the front room, and the party went on, and this was a party that had been, the invitation to which had been broadcast on the radio for a couple of weeks. So it was quite a party. The police didn't come, but almost, maybe they did come towards the end. And um, there were people falling in love there, and it was uh, an amazing event. We didn't, we chose not to do it again because it was a little bit too much. I'd taken everything I owned and put it in one of the bedrooms, so the rest of the place was open, one bedroom the dining room and the living room with a band, live salsa band in the front room. And um, people came. And it was quite a community at that point. There was uh, a lot of political movement. There was uh, Roberto Vargas, the great poet, uh, the activist poet, who basically shepherded the work that led to the creation of the Mission Cultural Center, along with Nina Serrano and the other founding members. It was a trade. Uh, the downtown interests, the classical culture people, could get their hundreds of millions of dollars worth of brand new music building, and the communities, the neighborhoods, could get their, you know, hundred or two hundred thousand dollar buildings uh, to start, th to do and maintain their own classes, their art classes, and so on and so forth. 
and that was the Mission Cultural Center that was Roberto Vargas. There was also Alejandro Murguia, another poet. Gato is his nickname at that point. And um, Nina Serrano, the poet, and Ena Hernandez, the poet. So great, San Francisco, great poetry scene and um, great sympathy between poetry communities. There was uh, Nanos Valoritis, who would attend the Latino events. And there was um, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, who would attend our events, and we would attend his events. And so there was a, a great creative community and many aspects to it. There were the designers. San Francisco has always been a, a creative center. And at that point, there was um, um, a great television series that had just begun called Open Studio Television, which was community oriented television, Channel 9, KQED, Mothership uh, KQED, had some grants from um, the Ford Foundation and so on, and had the will, had the leadership that had the will to want to do this kind of programming, that is to serve the community, and how to do that, hold up a mirror, that is show the great music, show the great culture, show the, the, the cooking and so on and so forth. That was a, a very big deal. Um, also in the group, Fernando Alegria, the poet, who was a, a professor at Stanford, and so he had a great deal of, of cachet, and he was, his poetry was unstinting. Um, <clears throat> Instructions for the Undressing of the Human Race was a, a small chapbook which he published, along with George Hitchcock, who lived in the Santa Cruz Mountains, who um, ran Kayak Press. We had a um, a major cultural event that started at Stanford with Sweat Lodge, which was an all-night vigil and a sweat lodge, and poetry sessions that occurred at Stanford. It was uh, the Sexto Sol conference, which was huge. People came from New York, came from Texas. So San Francisco was a center, and the community that I was part of was really a very dynamic, varied, group of women and men and we were very active and uh, Fernando Alegria's children were part of the Comunicación Aslan. Um, Andres Alegria, um, technically minded person, um, very competent, he learned to mix. He was mixing um, programs for us back then in the 70s. Eventually, he moved on into television and has ended up winning Emmys um, for television editing and um, has edited recently because we've also, some of us have kept in touch and we're still working together. Uh, Andres and the other Alegria, Isabel Alegria, Andres and Isabel um, worked also with Nina and I we were the original Comunicación Aslan group. Uh, recently, on the 30th anniversary of the September 11th, 1973 military coup in Chile, fascist military coup, the 30th anniversary of that, first 911, that one, we produced a, a CD uh, that is a s couple of radio programs, half hour radio programs. Now those radio programs traveled the world, including they were broadcast by Radio Hilversum when they were still doing that, that is picking up original materials by independent production groups and broadcasting them on their shortwave service. The program um, Chile Promise of Freedom was broadcast three times by Radio Hilversum, as well as extensively in Australia and throughout the United States. This was a, a, a piece of work that um, seven of us did over a year. We met once or twice a month. We had assignments, we did interviews, and we put together this brilliant piece of work, which from my point of view, we kind of won an Academy Award of radio production because if a, a foreign radio service, international radio service, says that your quality is sufficient to reach their air, you've done pretty well. And of course, no money, no money, no money. This was just, we needed to have the truth out there. We needed to have our point of view out there. 
And that's what we did. And that was a, a, just a small touch of the community. And the community, of course, is very, very wildly varying. People from New York would come in, the Miguel Pinero, Miguel Algarin, and uh, um, other poets would, would join us. And that was quite, quite a fabulous time. Oh, and, and the theater groups. Oh, I forgot to say, I want to go Comunicación. One more thing. In 1974, Comunicación Aslan sent a team, a production team, down to Mexico City, which was the um, Quinto Festival de Teatros Chicanos, Primer Encuentro Latinoamericano, which occurred in Mexico City, hosted by Los Mascarones and... Um, Teatro de la Gente was there, and about 50 different theater groups from all over Latin America came together and for about a week, and we had three different theatrical presentations every night, up sometimes even four. And we went off into the jungle in, next to El Tajin in the Veracruz region, the Olmec region. Um, we had... Um, ceremonies at El Tajin with the voladores. So there was a mixture of current culture and past culture, traditional culture as it were, mixing and, and being together. And the theater groups would travel hours fording scre uh, streams and rivers that didn't have bridges to do theater in rural communities. That was how we ended because our work, we ended our work by beginning our work, and it was a wonderful experience. We had daily reports on KPFA uh, from the production team that was traveling to the radio production team, and at that point um, I was also reading the papers fairly carefully, and I sent notice of Lucio Cabanas, who is a school teacher, who rose up against the Mexican government because of lack of responsiveness to the needs of the people, Lucio Cabañas. Well, five days after we broadcast the name Lucio Cabañas here at KPFA, the New York Times finally put a notice, an inch or two notice, about Lucio Cabañas in their newspaper. So we beat the New York Times. During the time I was working at Open Studio TV, it became clear that I was not going to get a job at KQED. I had attempted to find funding to finance a television station that had been given to KQED, which was called at that point KQEC, Channel 32. And that channel was basically given by Westinghouse Corporation to KQED to run and to operate as a, quote, minority television station. Well, that wasn't really a good idea, according to the managers of KQED. So they closed down the television station, and they reneged on their pr promises to operate it. But there was a production group that had been in training to manage the TV station and to produce programs. And that group was called Open Studio TV. And Don Roman managed it. Um, Fred Perry was there. Sandy Cupid, uh, Lonnie Ding, and uh, a number of other people. But uh, Mr. Johnson, there were basically seven of us. And we produced six distinct half-hour radio program, uh, t television programs every week. So that was nearly 200 radio programs in the course of a year, which was a very elevated rate of production. And six half-hours with a staff of seven, uh, not counting the camera people and the audio, that is the, the technical crew in the studio that actually put the image on the tape, but the producers, we were seven, the whole production staff. And of course, again, no money. So in order for us to use the television station that had been given to KQED, I looked for money for that, and I w approached a millionaire. Well, that millionaire was buddies with one of the managers, 
at the TV station. And so that manager called me in and said, if I were your boss, I'd fire you right this minute because there you are going around management and trying to start this minority television station that has been given to us and we just want to shut it down because we need the money to uh, fund for cost overruns on a, a senior program series called Over Easy TV. All that politics meant that my time as a, an employee of KQED was short. So when I heard about a job in Washington, D.C., I applied and um, I got a call from the manager of that program. They said, well, got your application. You're one of 150 people. And over the following days, um, she would call now and again and say, well, you're now one of 30. You made the cut to 30. And then eventually I was down to, I made the cut to two, but it went to the other woman. But then the other, the, the other person said, um, can't do it. And so I got the job, a job in Washington, D.C. at what is called the mothership of public broadcasting, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And I was the assistant to the director of training and development, Martha Carroll. And uh, she was short there. She'd been there too long and had, had too many bad memories. So she told me the first day that I was on the job, she took me to lunch and said, Danielle, um, if you learn this job, you will probably have it when I leave and I'm trying to get out of here. Within six months she was gone and uh, it took me a while before they finally gave me the title, but they certainly gave me the work. I took over her job. It was smooth. The transition was smooth. The job was done. Eventually I got the, I got the position, I got the title, and I got the low end of the money. About five blocks from the White House, up 16th Street from the White House in Washington, D.C., next to the Soviet Embassy where um, the NSA, the National Security Administration of the United States, was sending microwave beams at the embassy to read the messages that were on the computer and on their radio. So, but if you shoot microwaves, you get to listen in, as it were. Well, my office was right in the way, so I lost the hearing in one ear, and uh, a number of people died of cancer, a way larger number of people on that side of the building got what is called crossfire um, exposures to microwave. And um, this is not just me talking, because eventually a PBS engineer came with his wand, his magic wand, that can, can measure microwaves, because it turns out that at that point, you, don't, you can't go down to the local grocery store and buy a microwave reader. It was at that point in the middle 70s, um, not much, or late 70s even, not much in evidence. So a PBS engineer came because I wanted to, to be measured because the American embassy in, the, in Moscow, according to the New York Times, had been bombarded by microwaves. So I said, if the Moscow United States embassy is being bombarded from microwaves, why is the United States not bombarding the Soviet embassy? And I said, there's no good reason. Turned out I was right. The engineer came to the office muttering bitterly under his breath saying, why am I here? This is a waste of time. There's no reason for there to be microwaves here. No possible way in the world is going to be microwaves here. He goes to my office. I had a window office, which looked out over the Soviet embassy, <clears throat> looking north, turns on his wand and says, holy shit. And I look, at the I look at the needle and I see nice, big, strong microwave field. No reason for it to be there, but there it is. Unless you think that the Soviet embassy is an object of interest of the NSA and that the NSA is using its latest tools, then there's a good reason to, for there to be a microwave. Then he went to the next door, bill, next door office and there it was again. He went upstairs and as he, he was measuring it up there too and then suddenly, it stopped. 
someone must have seen him at the window with a wand and said, we got to turn this one off. So they turned it off. It is, in the um, scientific parlance, stochastic. That is, there is an on and there is an off. So microwave poisoning, um, a lot of politics happened. I didn't want to do anything. I just liked my job. I was doing good work, helping minorities and women get trained into positions of responsibility at television and radio stations around the country. That's what I wanted to do. All I wanted of them was to, you know, protect my office from the microwaves. They can shoot their microwaves. They just don't shoot me. Well, they couldn't say that they were shooting microwaves. So there was this funny little social thing going on. Eventually, some super right-wing person got a hold of the memo that I had sent to the administration about, would you just fix my office? It's an unsafe workplace. This was even before there were really much workplace safety rules around. But I asked him, and so someone stole that memo, gave it to the Chicago Tribune, Chicago Tribune reporter called me up, set, set me up beautifully, invited me to dinner or to lunch rather at, a, at the Hayes Adams uh, Hotel, which is of Watergate fame and a lot of stuff happens in Washington at the Hayes Adams, which is just up the street from the White House. And at the food court, um, after the salad, and just as we're about, just as I'm about to get into the <laughs> entree, she says, well, what about the microwaves? Well, this was closely held. I wasn't going to let anybody know. I wasn't letting it out. But somebody else did, and she obviously had a copy of it, and I said no comment. And, uh, but it reached, the, it reached the news. The Tribune published it. The, the, basically the contents of the thing and the allegations, making sure to mix up the, uh, the facts. And the mix-up was a lot of people that I spoke with or spoke to me after said, well, what were the Russians using microwaves for? I said, no, 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 no. The Russians are being bombarded by microwaves and I'm in the crossfire. I'm just accident. They don't want to read my, my typing. I'm talking about grants. Who cares about that? And they can read about it. It's public information. So, but it then there's a, a slight mix-up on the administrative level. They, I said, well, look, I've been planning a, a trip to uh, Europe. Don't you think it'd be good for me just to take my vacation? Because uh, the thing had blown up on Friday, on Thursday. It was Friday. I'm talking to the head, and I'm saying, I have ticket, airplane tickets to Europe on Tuesday. And they said, no, you can't go, you can't go, you can't go. Somehow they're wanting to control me or something. And then apparently he got better advice. And I was then called by the man Friday afternoon suit, go, just go. So I was unavailable for a comment after, after the initial, was nightly news that was hit the news on national television, a public broadcasting, a public broadcasting corporation executive. I was an executive suddenly because I'm, I was a, a manager of an area. So that was CPB and training. And the good part was I learned how, to, how Washington, D.C. operates. I saw a little bit of it. Uh, I testified before Congress. Testimony that I wrote ended up on their desks. Um, I answered questions at a national level. I went to national meetings of television and radio, so I got to have a fairly good impression of how public broadcasting functioned then. This was in the 70s. By 1980, I left uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and um, taught at Hunter College, taught documentary radio production, designed the syllabus, obtained the syllabus, um, built the studio, and we had a great time. The class was always fully and fully subscribed when I taught it. Then I ended up going down to Nicaragua, uh, doing communications work there, uh, working with the Ministry of Agriculture, their communications department. And um, 
Then I came back to the United States and got a job at KALW. KALW, uh, the school district's radio station, full power um, NPR affiliate in the heart of San Francisco. Sleepy little thing of a radio station, hugely conflicted. Uh, two weeks before I arrived, they had the New York, the San Francisco Chronicle had published an entire page of criticisms and letters blaming back and forth. So the, the place as an institution was in trouble. And that was what I took over. Um, and seven years later, as I left to go become the manager of a television station in Philadelphia, a PBS affiliate, the Chronicle, the same Chronicle, published in its op-ed page an, uh, an editorial saying, K-A-L-W, a local treasure. And um, KQED copied our format, news and talk. That was what they followed. We were the ones who initiated it. Um, I had hired some consultants while the manager of the radio station, and I said, well, what, what are our... What are our alternatives in terms of programming? And they said, well, you've got to lose that talks format. I said, oh, yeah, well, thanks for the advice. Here's your money. And I didn't take the advice. And then it turns out that these same people who had given me advice were advising KQED to be talk radio because this was going to be the future. So you have to, you know, don't always listen to experts and so on, or, or listen to them and then make your own decisions. WYBE-TV in Philadelphia was a new television station and I became the manager there. It was a very interesting circumstance designed to serve minority communities and the underserved communities in the um, listening area, viewing area of Philadelphia and the region. Philadelphia is in a mountainous area, a hilly area, so cable systems are very important. And uh, part of my work there, I was there for four years at WIBE, was to ensure that the television station got onto all of the cable systems that were appropriate. I was able to um, work with a volunteer who was there for some time. He did most of the work under my direction. We contacted every cable system in every town and made sure that they were gonna carry us and we made sure we carried. As a result, the television station is very well represented throughout the region at this point. Also, uh, our equipment again was very, very bad and I again wrote a successful equipment grant which made our signal on the when you on the cable as you change through it used to be that when you came to our station it was fuzzy the colors were a little off and so on but after the equipment was installed you could not tell the difference between ABC TV and WYBE TV or our much um, better funded sister station down river uh, I'm blocking its name now. Okay, um, it'll come to me. But there was another television station, another non-commercial television station there. Oh boy, matter of age. Um, they were our enemy, basically. They didn't. They wanted us to starve to death, but we didn't starve to death. We grew, and the TV station is now alive. Unfortunately, the board of directors self-selecting moved in the direction of the tennis set so that uh, tennis and cooking has overcome um, political historical social concerns and that is the fate of the television station at this point it's not quite the vision that uh, we had hoped for KALW is still a very special station and many people swear by it. It's the less obvious, less um, flashy version of um, news and information, more locally oriented. 
So, KQ, um, WYBE, teeny little television station. Basically, uh, our offices were above a paint store. Our studios were above a paint store. Although the signal and the transmitter was 1.7 million watts, which is a lot of watts, which is a lot of electricity, which is a lot of bills for electricity. But uh, we managed to pay it. We managed to do it. We had the only AIDS-related or public health program broadcast on a weekly basis. We brought in the news from um, Japan every night. It was a wonderful program and personally one of my favorites because here we are in Philadelphia and news about Asia and about the Pacific Rim was clearly almost non-existent in any other of the media. So we clearly had something special. And for a time we also had uh, Can uh, Canal 2, which was a French news program. And we broadcast that at 10, so French students could tune in and practice their French by watching the news. And as well as inform all of us about what the real news was, because even at that point, in 1978, um, 79, News was being censored. I mean, there was the, the mainstream news was losing it, basically. So that at some particular war, the United States press would say, nothing is happening. It's all peaceful. Then you tune in to the French uh, channel and you'd see United States warplanes loaded with bombs taking off down the runway. So you say, well, you read between the lines, right? What, what is really happening? Um, it was a great time. It was four years in the Philadelphia region, great museums, um, and some Latino, basically Puerto Rican community that I related to and the arts community that we related to. And that was a, a, quite an interesting time, again, now I'm attending the same national conferences that I used to attend as a member of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the mothership, and now I am one of the managers, one of the, basically, one of the princes. I, I, my metaphor for a manager of a television or a radio station is that they are a prince or a princess because their word is what it is. The uh, FCC rules and so on say, the manager manages and the committee can advise, the board can advise, but it really is the metaphor. You have to make sure your running lights are on. This is one of the important things, the tower lights. You have to make sure your tower lights are on so that nobody will run into you like a ship. And you steer it in the way that you're supposed to um, and make sure you don't run into other things. That's all about the metaphor, the operating metaphor is the ship's captain. And that's how I managed KQED, I mean uh, WYBE and um, KALW. I feel I have inherited my mother's energy, so I don't rest for long. My preferred mode of existence is to be active to be doing things. And some of the other things I've done in life, um, I was the general manager, or the director of the Mission Cultural Center at a critical time when uh, it had been looted basically by um, the evil directors who had been appointed or had themselves appointed and basically looted the place. And when they left, they left no financial records whatsoever and they had failed to pay taxes and all of the records were gone. So part of my job as the manager at that point was to get regular, that is find a proper accountant and do all of the accounting. Hillary Cosby did the accounting and we managed to recreate all of the necessary information and to pay our taxes. So the Mission Cultural Center 
got to survive. And I went to all the granting agencies and assured them of our soundness and moving along a small um, contretemps with the ex with the president of the board led to my departure there she wanted to be limiting uh, spending down to the hundred dollars and she also had had a run-in with one of the uh, curators years before and she neglected to tell me this and so I had arranged to have an exhibit of Chilean graphics hosted by a Chilean artist. And this Chilean artist and the president of the board um, did not get along well. And so she forced the cancellation of the Chilean exhibit at a very late date. And that led to my basically departing Mission Cultural Center. People wanted me to go public and so on. But the place had had so much uh, trouble that I thought I was much more interested in having the institution continue to grow and my difference of opinion uh, can disappear into history basically. I also had the great pleasure of working at the Mexican Museum and helping with fundraising and all the grants that I wrote ended up being funded, including one that I particularly liked, which was to put the collection or part of the collection online. That was a way for the Mexican Museum to enter into the circle of museums online. This was years ago. I don't know whether they're still doing that. Also, um, I've been traveling a lot since the passing of my dear wife, Susan Miriam Castellan. Uh, I've traveled to uh, Chile to find the bones of my father that had been lost. I found him. I buried him in a place which is supposedly forever. And along with my half-brother, whom I found quite by accident along the way at the University of California, because this young woman put her blanket next to my blanket, and so we got together and she knew my brother, she knew of my brother, which is the only way I could know because my father had died and I never had the name or address of my brothers. I found them. Working in the media essentially since 1970, I've done, made, I've made media, I've consumed media. I'm one of the few nuts that buys five newspapers at a time just because I want to see how stories are being handled from one place to another, New York Times versus the LA Times versus Muck Paper, which is the San Francisco Chronicle. And I've been working also with um, Paper Tiger TV, and which is a national progressive television um, organization underfunded. Basically, the media serves the same function that the church fun um, served in medieval times. It was this, basically the sole source of, quote, information and of what I would call political programming because the media also tells you what you should think. Um, for example, there's um, a concerted attack on the Venezuelan democracy going on. It has to do basically with oil, we all know. I mean, oil, it's, the, it's the oil, stupid. But the media slavishly repeats the fact that President Chavez is a dictator. And if you read even National Geographic, which by the way is owned by Rupert Murdoch these days, in the National Geographic, a, a magazine that I thought was immune from such political pressures and mistakes, they called Chavez, they had a big article on Venezuela, and they called Chavez a dictator. How many times does a man have to be elected, democratically elected, and elected with uh, the, the world community looking at you in order to be considered a president instead of a dictator? Well, it turns out that never. The answer is never, because the media serves the political interests of the people who own the media. 
If you want a free press, buy one. That's the only free press there is, and it's a bit uh, cynical, but that's what it is. They're not here to do us any favors. The reason the media are here are to, number one, sell us things. Number two, keep us stupid. They give us a lot of stupid stuff. Not everyone, not all the time. There's occasionally a good thing on PBS, but basically it's to keep us stupid. It's stupefying. Um, Iraq, have we gotten the straight story there? Not really. We have so-called embedded journalism as if that is something neat and wonderful. Well, embedded anything, I mean, how? You want to embed somebody with uh, the mafia so they can get their story out? Well, anyway, Venezuela, ditto Cuba. Cuba, a hungry, barefoot country of now maybe 14 million. Back then when they were the principal enemy, the arch enemy of the United States, they were 10 million people. 10 million versus 200 million. What's the beef here? Well, it turns out that it's the thinking, it's the ideas that are different. In Cuba, the idea is that the communal good, the commons is important, as well as the individual. But here in the United States, we have been poisoned by an ideology that says it's only the individual. And the church, our modern day version of the church, the media, does everything in its power to convince us of the rightness of its interpretation of history and its interpretation of what's going down. What I'm going to do is continue to do media events, media things, radio programs, television programs, I have, at this age, acquired a vast library of records, remember records, of um, CDs, of uh, videos. I have maybe 30 or 40 videos that I want to edit. I have maybe 100,000 negatives and maybe tease out a book out of that, a book or two, Latin America and Life. Um, essays, travel, I still have to see China, I haven't been to China. When I finish, I'm working on a book on um, India, Stepwells, with a colleague, an Indian woman who is teacher, a teacher here in the United States, Purnima Bhatt. And I have different projects to do and I have to put away my library. I don't want it to end up in the dumpster because it's valuable material for future generations. My favorite thing to do is to walk on the beach and collect stones. And I'll be doing that too, as much as I can. And uh, I haven't hit the hammock enough. I want to go on the hammock every once in a while. But in, while I can still run around, I still want to do some more things, including all these different projects. And uh, make sure my beloved is a happy camper keep her happy, keep me happy, keep me safe and sound as I confront all of life's challenges. After all, being born is a death sentence.